All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Local Government Insights Podcast, Modernizing Government Leadership, your source and insight for local government technology. My name is Brendan Middleton, and today we're going to be speaking with Jess Knudsen, City Manager from Lake Havasu, Arizona, on the impact that COVID-19 had on tourism in the city and how swift decision-making led to record increases in revenues. Hi, Jess. It's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Brennan. Uh, this, yeah, this is uh, I'm Jess Knutson. Uh, I get that uh, quite a bit in terms of the pronunciation of the uh, of the name. Um, so, uh, um, thanks for for uh, for having me uh, here today, and uh, look forward to a great conversation. Awesome. So, as I mentioned, Jess is the city manager from Lake Havasu, Arizona. And in quick summary of our episode today, Jess and I will be talking about the impact that COVID had on tourism trends and what that means for Lake Havasu. We'll also discuss the importance of communication, especially during COVID, but more so the importance as Lake Havasu became a main destination for travelers amidst the pandemic. We'll also talk about some unanticipated revenue surplus over the past year and what that what led to that. And further, what areas on the backside uh, have investment have been made due to the surplus? And lastly, we'll discuss a unique resource alliance that was established to help the small business community. So Jess, let's start by talking about the makeup of Lake Havasu in general, and and then can you walk us through the 2020 March slash April timeframe and what what that looked like for residents and local government as a whole? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, uh, Brennan. Um, Lake Havasu City is a a wonderful destination spot. So we are a tourism city. Uh, we have uh, the Lower Colorado River uh, runs right through Lake Havasu City. And uh, thanks to the the creation of the Parker Dam uh, many decades uh, ago, it's uh, created kind of a, a lake atmosphere. So we are a destination spot uh, for those that want to uh, come out and uh, and boat, um, and certainly recreate in, in that area. Lots of hiking, a lot of uh, trails, a lot of uh, side by side and four wheeling out in the, out in the desert areas as well too. So uh, people come to uh, have a suit for a variety of reasons, uh, including our wonderful restaurants and other destination spots. But we are, um, we are, we rely as an economy. We rely on on tourism. So any uh, disruptions to uh, the tourism industry is going to impact our uh, our small businesses, our restaurants, our bars, our uh, retail shops, and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> when the pandemic started, that was a real big scare for uh, for us. Uh, it, as we all know, it happened in, in kind of that March April timeframe is when things really started to explode, and there's a lot of unknowns that were occurring at that time. Uh, we had no idea what to uh, what that was going to look like for uh, for a tourism town. Um, if travel is being banned and, and people are quarantined in their in their homes, they're not going to come to Havasu. And from our permanent residents' perspective, they didn't want those those tourists coming to Lake Havasu City. They, they were they were scared. Uh, we received hundreds of calls for a while there for about a good month on a, on a daily basis. Um, some of those calls were shut down the lake, shut down the highway access, uh, don't let people in. Um, our mayor, our tourism bureau, and others were asking people. We put out ads and uh, videos asking people, now is not the time to travel to Lake Havasu City. Uh, it had zero impact. People were, uh, were, uh, were rushing to the area, and uh, um, there, was a, there was a lot to uh, unravel throughout, throughout, uh, throughout that time. That's awesome. And, and as I understand, as, as kind of May rolled around, and a couple months later after what you're describing now, Things began to drastically change. Obviously, the tourism kind of went down uh, less than 10 percent, as you mentioned. But can you discuss some of the trends you were seeing and highlight the decisions you and your staff had to make during this time as things started to change? Yeah, sure. So that to that March, April time frame is when budgets are being uh, drafted and and uh, um, projections are, are being made. And and what a what a crazy time that was for uh, for all of us at, in uh, in the municipal uh, uh, arena. Um, March, we our tourism was was uh, dropped off. We we didn't we saw we didn't see any tourism that, that took place. We had, uh, you know, uh, less than 10% capacity in in our uh, our hotels, and I think that's probably generous. Um, maybe that second week of April is when things started really to take off, and and uh, tourism started to explode, and our hotels were were filled. Our boat launches that are uh, that we have in Lake Havasu, there there were lines. It would take you hours to launch your boat. Um, through the state park or through the private marinas or the other launches that that uh, that are available out there. Um, so we we experienced a whole month without any tourism, and then uh, and then it started to pick up, and we're trying to develop a budget. And uh, frankly, Brennan, we didn't uh, really know how to uh, how to address it, how to project those uh, the, you know the revenues, um, you know, for that upcoming budget year. So we did a couple things. One, I, I developed a, a a plan that I call Plan B, in one of the meetings, and I just kind of took off in terms of us talking about plan B and plan B was identification of 
certain projects within the budget that we would uh, fund, but only as of uh, January 1st and only uh, after we would get a, uh, we'd be able to get into the budget a little bit more and understand what the revenues look like um, and to see if there was, that was something that we could uh, we could progress forward with. Uh, in the meantime, we projected uh, declines of 10% uh, with uh, with revenues, which is a you know pretty big number for a municipality. Um, and then made sure that we had we accounted for any type of uh, grants or future revenues or uh, or um, tourism swings that uh, that might take place. So really, we were looking at uh, projecting a 10% decrease and allowing for maybe a um, um, 10 plus uh, percent increase in, in revenues coming forward and then and then adopted that that plan B uh, scenario. Um, so that, that's how we put together the budget. We put together what we thought was a really large target and, and uh, we tried to make sure that we were going to manage that budget throughout the fiscal year uh, to utilize our taxpayer dollars in a, in a wise manner. Um, even with that large range that we identified in that budget year, we missed. Uh, the, the revenues came in much higher than, than uh, anybody had anticipated. Uh, through May of the, this year, so um, through May of the last fiscal year, as we entered, we're into the uh, new fiscal year here in July, uh, we were about uh, 28 to 29 percent uh, year to year uh, projections uh, in increase in, in, uh, in uh, um, tourism uh, sales tax dollars, including bed tax and, and our food and beverage tax that we have out here. That was again 28.5 percent exactly is what we are um, year to year. Uh, 64 percent above uh, projected budget. Wow. So yeah, that, that was, that's a that's a big number that we were looking at there. So. Uh, really, it really took off for us and, and allowed us to, to to make some good decisions. But um, at, during that time, flashing back, um, you know, you think back to March, April, and, and uh, it seems like 10 days ago, and it seems like uh, 10 decades ago, all, all at the same time. Uh, we're trying to make all the decisions, that, the best decisions that we could at that time uh, to put the city in the position to provide services and protect our residents and, and allow for um, safe uh, a safe environment for the tourists as well as, of course, our residents. Awesome. And given that surplus, there's obviously downstream effects to that and prob most likely provided you with options to divert some of that surplus into in areas of investment. And I'd like to talk about that in just a minute. You and I discussed previously on one of our pre-show interviews that there, there were some specific areas you would begin investing that surplus and you began to map those out almost immediately. Can you highlight some of those areas of spending that the city has begun due to the that 2020 increase? Yeah, I can. Um, and in previous years, I think it's important to know that uh, we don't the, the revenues that come into Lake Havasu City are, are uh, at percentage wise are, are low. We are our property tax rate is uh, 67 cents. Um, our sales tax is 2 percent. Uh, bed tax is 4 uh, percent. We uh, we don't have uh, a large um, rates. Our residents appreciate low taxes. So uh, for several years, we uh, We've uh, had enough to uh, to bring in to provide services, and uh, with a really kind of a bare bones budget. So we've been talking about for several years about the needs of the of the city, but haven't been able to uh, to fund those needs. Um, as city managers, we all get requests coming from the different department heads every budget year, um, and uh, probably on average, I get about 15 to 17 million dollars worth of requests from department heads. And in previous years, I was I'd use the savings realized from the previous year to fund some one time. Mm -hmm. projects going into the into the uh, the next year and again that uh, on average 15 to 17 million dollars requests coming from department heads uh, I was approving maybe a, a million million and a half of the, of those requests so very bare bones budget so now that we look at uh, the, the cares dollars that came in we looked at an increase in some of the uh, the tourism dollars uh, it was important for us not to uh, add additional costs that we couldn't sustain in future years but uh, to invest in our infrastructure invest in our facilities and uh, our, and put us in, in, a, in a spot where we can spend a few dollars now uh, with uh, that would ensure our cost savings in, in future years. So uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, facility maintenance. So we're investing a lot in and uh, uh, programming with facility maintenance. Our aquatic aquatic center is looking at a new uh, um, um, we call it an HVAC, uh, but it's more than just a, a um, an HVAC system. It's airflow. There's a lot of humidity issues that are causing concerns with that building. Our police facility. Um, we did an assessment uh, upwards of uh, three to four million dollars worth of needs are in, in that uh, in that building alone. Um, Lake Havasu City has never had a standalone municipal court. We've been a consolidated court with the with Mojave County uh, for um, since the inception of uh, in Lake Havasu. 
and uh, we uh, deconsolidated that court, but are still in that same county courthouse. So uh, it's, I guess it's kind of like uh, getting a divorce and still living with your spouse. So that's the situation mm -hmm. we're in right now. Uh, and uh, we use some of the, the CARES dollars that, that were, that were uh, um, granted to cities uh, to purchase a uh, fitness center. The owners had retired, the fitness center was closing. Uh, all the issues with, with, uh, with regards to the pandemic obviously had an impact on, on their business model. But even prior to that, they were uh, planning on, on retiring and, and selling their building. It's adjacent to the city hall complex. So that opportunity came up where we can expand our city hall complex and, and uh, with the property and then purchase a building that we can, we can renovate um for a for a courthouse so we purchased that courthouse we're now underway with the design uh, for the renovations of that uh of that building um, but those are some uh, some examples there and then getting into uh, this fiscal year uh, i took a close look at uh, some of the personnel needs and requests that i've had to uh, uh, de uh decline in future years they're needed but we didn't have the dollars to sustain it and uh, so i looked at uh, tr some of our uh, bottlenecks within the organization uh, we have two employees that work in procurement and uh, our employees work very hard in procurement. Uh, they're usually the last ones to leave at the end of the day. Um, so looking at uh, a new position there, um, two new positions in, um, in IT that will help with uh, bringing on that to that courthouse. Uh, and then um, within some of our uh, um, engineering um, um, uh, positions that, uh, that occur there, uh, public dispatchers, some of those positions are able to bring some, uh, some additional positions within uh, Within uh, within the organization, and again, the the initial concept there was to identify positions that were bottlenecks in the organization. So if if we have two uh, two employees in, in procurement and they're doing a really good job, but they, they need uh, additional assistance, what's happening is it's taking weeks and months for uh, a bid document to get uh, to get through that uh, that process, which then delays uh, other departments and and causes uh, concerns there. So that was that was the strategy all along was to try and invest into our existing infrastructure. And to uh, um, invest into the uh, the organization to, to try to streamline our, our process and make our employees more efficient. And uh, um, but the overarching goal here is to put ourselves in a better position to provide services uh, to our residents. That's incredible. And I, I understand there's a very unique antique there in the city. Uh, and I think you're coming up on an anniversary. Can you talk about the the, the London's Bridge a little bit? Yeah. So. Uh, um, Robert McCulloch is the is the founder of uh, Lake Havasu City. Um, he's known for being a, a very bold entrepreneur, and mm -hmm. uh, um, we are we are, this is the 50th uh, um, year, the anniversary. We're calling it our golden anniversary of when the world's largest antique, uh, the London Bridge, was uh, was was uh, um, dedicated and uh, officially uh, open. Uh, Robert McCulloch purchased the London Bridge um, from London and. Uh, the old song about London Bridge falling down. It was falling down <laughs> in London and uh, Robert McCulloch purchased it, uh, shipped it brick by brick to Lake Havasu City. Uh, at the time, there was a, a portion of land that kind of jutted out towards the lake and he built the bridge on top of the land and then dug out a channel area. We call it the channel today. So that uh, now separates uh, the uh, the mainland Lake Havasu City from, uh, from our island and uh, the bridge uh, spans that. In that area down there, we call it the English Village, and uh, there's a, a lot of different uh, shops and uh, um, and just kind of sights to see. Um, you can take a jump on the ferry boat and go across the lake. There's the, the casino on the other side. Uh, there is lots of uh, watercraft, paddle boards, other things uh, to uh, to rent, and just a really ex a good experience to walk through that area. It's it's a uh, it's it's a very unique situation for us, and it uh, it spurred a lot of uh, tourism for Lake Havasu City. That's incredible. Well, good luck on the anniversary. I know mm -hmm. that's coming up. Yeah, it's coming in October. We have lots of events planned for it. That's awesome. So, so Jess, if we could spend just a few minutes and talk about the small business community, shift a little bit and talk about the small business community. For many local governments, especially small and, and medium-sized local governments, small business community, as we know it, is kind of the heartbeat of, of the jurisdiction. And I'd love to spend a few minutes and talk through kind of what is the overview and the makeup of your small business community? How was it affected? And can you further explain kind of some of the awesome initiatives that you and your team put together amidst the economic crisis last year? Sure, um, we'll do, Brennan. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we are, are uh, again, we're a tourism town and a tourism community that's very dependent upon uh, tourism. Uh, that's how the city pays its bills, right? And uh, um, so a lot of our businesses within Lake Havasu City are geared towards tourism. Lots of hotels, bars, restaurants, 
uh, retail shops, uh, things of uh, things of that nature. Um, again, all heavily reliant on on tourism. When the pandemic hit, uh, there was a lot of fear um, uh, with regard to the small businesses. Um, the, some of the thoughts coming from the city is how can we help some of these small businesses just get through a couple months and uh, would make all the difference in, in the world to them. If the, if they aren't able to pay the bills in the next month or two and, and go uh, and go under, um, what is that business? Is that building going to remain vacant and and uh, uh, will that business ever be able to uh, to revive, revive itself? So we were trying to uh, come up with different ideas um, for maybe how how to assist those uh, those small businesses. We used a, a small portion of our CARES Act funding. Um, we took two hundred fifty thousand dollars and uh, um, and and uh, created what was called the the uh, the uh, the alliance. The resource alliance is made up of our uh, um, of the city um, with Lake Havasu City, with our local United Way, our local Chamber of Commerce, our Better Business Bureau, and uh, our Havasu uh, Health Foundation, Havasu Community Health Foundation, uh, which provides the food bank services and other many many social services in the in the community. Um, they raised uh, about uh, eighty thousand dollars or so. We invested as a city two hundred fifty thousand dollars into that uh, into that fund, and. Uh, Throughout that uh, that process, they were able to assist uh, over uh, 100 businesses, uh, as well as a couple hundred uh, individuals. Uh, with the businesses themselves, we didn't just give, write them a check and give it to them, or the or the re the resource alliance didn't uh, didn't do that. Um, but they were receiving applications or letters, and, and they were describing kind of their situation. And uh, the alliance took a really close look at um, bills that need to be paid. So whether it was going to be your utility bill, your rent bill. Um, all those things along those lines, and we didn't uh, give the money to the business. We we uh, cut checks, or excuse me, the Resource Alliance cut checks uh, to the utility company, to the uh, to the landlord, uh, to to help pay for some of those bills. So um, a lot of hard work by those uh, organizations. It was our vice mayor David Lane that uh, that led that uh, that effort for the for the city. Um, a lot of work they put in in reviewing those applications. Some really tough decisions, but. Um, in the end, it uh, it helped quite a bit, and just getting those some of those businesses over that hump while all those unknowns were uh, were taking place. That's incredible, and I love how the payments weren't made directly to the businesses, but rather kind of applied t directly towards the bills that needed to be covered. That's an impressive approach. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, very good one. So, lastly, to round us out today, Jess, can we talk about a, a topic that's obviously super relevant across the board, uh, and that's the ARPA uh, funding, American Rescue Plan. I'd love to get your perspective and ask this question on almost all of my interviews with local government leaders: is is how that plan might affect the recovery of Lake Havasu specifically? What are you hearing? What are you expecting in regards to direct funding for the city? And what do you what do you expect the next steps to be? Uh, lots of unknowns at this time too, so we're trying to kind of muddle through it. The uh, the CARES dollars that came in, uh, those were pretty clear in terms of how those could be spent, and and uh, we made some really good decisions uh, from the from the local perspective on how those dollars could best impact our our residents and uh, sustain the the city. Um, so th those were those were good things with regards to the rescue funds, um, the ARPA funds. It, it, for us, it, we're in a, a situation that, uh, that that we're struggling with to identify. To tie projects to the to uh, to these funds. Uh, first off, we were announced uh, that we were that uh, Lake Havasu City was going to get uh, 13.4 million dollars uh, in our in ARPA funds. Um, again, we uh, we didn't ask for it, uh, but we're we're looking at that and how do we invest that into the uh, uh, into uh, Lake Havasu City. Um, as time went by, we we realized that there was going to be a handful of cities, including Lake Havasu City, that were in a unique situation because of how the legislation was written. The uh, the funding mechanism or the formula for how the funds were going to be dispersed were, were based on the CDBG model. Um, so we are a population of over 50,000, but we are a non entitlement community. Um, all that is for, for some listeners are going to understand kind of what that means. But for uh, for the rest, essentially what that met, uh, means is that we were we were kind of a unique situation with how we uh, apply our community development block grant funds for our housing rehab uh, program um, because we were in that category. Uh, we we lost about five million dollars in in uh, ARPA funds or that allocation. So instead of getting the thirteen point four million dollars, uh, we uh, we now have been allocated uh, eight point five million dollars in uh, in ARPA funds. Um, so that was uh, kind of a kind of a sour pill to swallow, if you will. Um, good for our neighbors here in Mojave County. Uh, Bullhead City is one of our sister cities here, and and uh, um, we we love Bullhead City. Uh, they they were able to benefit uh, four million dollars. 
uh, because of that wow. uh, that CDBG funding uh, model that was out there. So now, we're, uh, all that being said, Lake Havasu City has a uh, the ARPA funds, the allocation for the ARPA funds of $8.5 million. When the news first came out, we heard things about water and sewer and broadband, all big needs for, uh, for Lake Havasu City. Uh, um, uh, roads would be a, an investment in our roads would be it would be fantastic. Um, all these core critical areas that 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 we need as a city for the for the long term. Uh, but you start peeling away at the at the onion at the onion a little bit, and you realize that uh, the broadband um, is only in, in uh, uh, rural communities that have a download um, speed of 25 megabytes per second or less. Uh, yeah. We have very intermittent inter, intermittent service out in the area. We'd love to see some improvements with. Uh, with broadband, but we don't meet that uh, that threshold. Uh, the water and sewer um, um, investments were had to be a, a slum and blight designation, or you had to show demographics that uh, uh, that, that served a certain um, a certain uh, well a certain demographic. So that, that otherwise that uh, those funds could be spent in that way. Um, that was the first blush of when the rules came out, and we scratched our head and said we don't even know uh, how, if we're going to be able to spend these funds. Uh, the other, with regards to ARPA, is if any losses you had in the previous year were uh, because of the due to the pandemic. Well, we didn't see any losses, so that that's something that we couldn't uh, couldn't take a, a look at there. Um, certainly, we have some needs. We'd like we'd love to take a look look at those dollars. Um, in, that, in the last uh, several uh, weeks, we've seen some uh, some more information come out about some of the changes with how those funds are being spent, and uh, so we're, we're taking a close look at that. Again, we, we'd love to do something with regards to uh, the broadband uh, roads, our, our infrastructure, um, and making some investments uh, uh, there. So, um, but we'll see. I have a we have a city manager conference coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'll be bending the ears of everybody at that conference to see uh, uh, how they're using those dollars and and uh, be generating some uh, some ideas on how that would benefit Lake Havasu. Yeah, and despite. In no specific action items so far. Just, I think it's super important to highlight that because so many local government leaders are are dealing with the same issues and they're facing the same challenges and dealing with the same decision making process. So I think it's important to to talk about it, even though there isn't specific things that you can tie back to. So thank you for sharing that, and honestly, thank you for doing this. Um, it's great to see the success that the city of Lake Havasu is having. Uh, I wish you and the city the best in the future es investments areas and and growth opportunities. We all continue to climb out of this pandemic. I really appreciate you sharing your story and and for all of our listeners thank you for joining us again on another episode of the local government insights podcast uh stay tuned for lo for more local government news and insights to come we look forward to to having you next time thanks again jess thank you brian